the musical autobiography of Michael Kennedy operatic tenor introduction of Kennedy's The First Act in the first group to be sent home in the third round of Britain's Got Talent 2009. In fact, the first act to be shown on film leaving the room of the grand staircase in Lancaster House, London. But Kennedy's The Act, Michael, Emily, Joseph and Adam. We sang Panics Angelicoops and were judged by Simon Cowell, Piers Morgan, Kelly Brook and Amanda Holden. This is an autobiographical account of his singing life up to press. Michael, winner of Hortfordle Music Festival Operatic Solo Class, Skipton Music Festival Tenor Class has played many cameo roles in opera and shows. Ten times winner of the Queen's Hotel Talent Competition in Blackpool. He has performed the tenor roles in the oratorios Messiah Handel, The Crucifixion Stainer and Magnificat Paragolazy. Michael has also gained popularity on the internet and many recorded examples exist on sites all over the cyber world. Notably he is also featured on the URDB website smashing all sorts of singing records. Michael Kennedy also has many musical compositions featured on the internet, an estimated quarter of a million views and potentially millions of other views with respect to Britain's Got Talent etc. He has composed symphonies, concertos and opera buffo that is also animated. Also as an artist he has gained much respect through landscape paintings on Art Wanted and has even sold a couple. This is how he has told the story. Poem I'm in Crowwood. Gold are the morning leaves fall in the clear sweet scent of their winter looms sun shimmers peaceful paths through the trees I will reflect the boots on the fallen rustling crunch a stick for Boris to fly retriever ready and birds to sing Michael Kennedy 30-11-2010 title Blackwoodston Opera Singer Chapter 1 The 1960 S. Blackburn. I was born on the 24th September 1959 at Queen's Park Hospital by C-section. My first recollections certainly were being awakened by my mother Isabel from Spain singing a Spanish song entitled Postife about a donkey and a wig. Singing downstairs in the kitchen of a gable and terraced house on Brumley Street No. 65 the steepest hill in Blackburn. Then onwards by years singing in school and church, St. Barnabas down Edison Street, carols at Christmas, songs in class and in front of the telly at my granddad's and grandma's in play Lee Moore's or at home. They seemed impressed and my father John wanted me to join the cathedral choir, but that never happened. Once I remember going on holiday to Fleetwood with Granddad Bill and Grandma Anne and on a fishing boat trip I started to sing Kelly from the Isle of Man and everyone joined in. My granddad a coal miner and legendary club singer had taught me this song and he laughed with all the other passengers on the boat. Perhaps I will upload a version in one breath to YouTube sometime. Time went on to me being seven, my lucky number according to Mum. One Sunday at my grandma and granddad's we were having lamb chops for dinner. As I was enjoying one chop coated in gravy, I broke my tooth on a bone. My next singing lesson was in the dentist chair. I have never felt such physical pain before and ever since that time shaping my very being. The ensuing torture as my tooth snapped produced screams of agony worse than any bad singer. My fear of the dentist is now deep-rooted. After this time I do not recall ever singing for many years. However, my uncle Antonio in Spain sent me for my eighth birthday a double-sided mouth organ. I learned to play many a tune on this by ear and I would sit on the doorstep and play it to my friends or alone. A contemplative time for brooding though to everyone's amusement. My dad would play it with his nose the 60s for many were bleak time. My dad used to cut up the Mars bar once a week for us all to eat. No such thing as coke but hired soda water bottles from a shop halfway up the street. I made sure I cleaned my teeth three times a day. I had great teeth but with my anxiety I sucked my thumb so in later life I had to wear braces at school. This was not conducive to singing songs or mouth organ playing. It was a time for sniffing fatties in the coal sheds and on garage roofs. Corpy bells rang out on Fridays and Sundays. Somehow, I must never forget the little girl who used to sit on our doorstep. This is a fading ghost in my head. We had tea dog these shows like I Love Lucy, Lost in Space, High Chaparral, Doctor Who and the Daleks, Top Cat, 
Blue Peter, Magpie, The Tomorrow People, The Avengers, Call My Bluff, U.F.O., The Underbirds, Stingray, Supercar, Len and the River Mob, Joe 90 Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Films, 2, Kill a Mockingbird and Ace in a Hole, All in Black and White Telly with Doors on a Cabinet, with Janet Dodgers and Milk. My mum would also smile and talk to the telly sometimes in disagreement at the news. I remember the moon shots on TV. I had a bright green foot scooter with yellow wheels that glinted in the summer sun as I sped down Rumley Street. At the top you could see all Blackburn, the gas hunger and various steam engines puffing away with huge plumes of steam and smoke. I remember going on holiday to Blackpool. The ghosts of the old engines rattling loudly through Blackburn Station to the end of the line haunts me to this day. Oh, those trains. After this there were the electricity strikes and the three-day week under Ted Heath's government. Candles and no television provided the ambience. I got a bright yellow chopper bike and a train set for one Christmas. Other years many other Christmas presents came from Daddy Christmas. Taro Al Corgi died. He was hit with a shovel on the back for shitting on some doorstep. He came in and whimpered under the stairs. A man in a white coat came to take him away. That was the end of Taro. Cass a Staffordshire Bull Terrier later replaced the Corgi. Whilst lying in bed I would shout come on Cass for a biscuit. He would come thundering up the stairs, diving onto my bed, licking my face. Gas would also chase me to bed at night it was a game. This one night dad gave me the head start, held the dog back like a coiled spring. The dog bolted and came after me. Halfway up the stairs he grabbed my little toe in a snarling gash of the mouth, almost ripping it off. Crying, it looked worse than it was and mum put an elastoclast on my toe. Dad whacked the dog hard with his slipper and Cass was relegated, howling and all night long, to the yard. Cass was sometimes useful to me. I would set him on the older bullies, who ran off screaming. Surprisingly, I would be able to call Cass back before he could do any real damage. After, mostly I just threatened the bullies with my attack dog. Behind the scenes though there was trouble and news was filtering back to Dad. One day the man in the white coat came for Cass. We were all in tears. Dad's statement at the time was I recall you had to be a fighting man to have a fighting dog. On YouTube I have uploaded photos and me playing the mouth organ to reflect upon these special times. I wish I could return. Of course some places in your childhood you don't want to revisit. No one does, it's the dark places you know and hate. You have to be careful of bad ladies and bad men. The horrific stories of Brady and Hindley and the man in Blackburn who stole a little baby girl from hospital and bashed her head against the wall. These stories haunted every parent's nightmares. But there is the lesser evil too. Adults would chase you and try to talk to you and sometimes worse try to get you on your own, no doubt thinking about it now. These were sick pedophiles. My dad became my hero at the ending of my childhood, a couple of youth-type thugs who were my bullies were vanquished quite effectively by my old dad. I never heard from or encountered any of them again. Ever since that time I have always wanted to make him proud of me, as I was always proud of my old dad. I remember the television again, its hollow drone. The show that sticks in my mind is Paper House Very Frightening and Casey Jones. I would sit behind the cabinet and it looked like a locomotive pretending to be the brave engineer. I made the understairs look like a ghost train with skeletons made from paper. I used a red toy trolley for the train. Note that the Battle of Coors took place in 1943 and General Zhukov led his troops and T-34 tanks to victory. Such was my victory in the winter of 1969 in the Battle of St. Barnabas Playground Snowball Fight. On my side I had all the younger kids plus all the girls just like the girls that were Red Army tank commanders. The big boys had built a snowball with our help stretching across the junior playground dividing it in half. And it started to snow and I mean really snow.
Clouds of heavy snowflakes rushed across the battlefield with the howling wind. Snow swirled, whirling around in little devils. My regiment took shelter under the shelter as we were bombarded by snow bombs. Only a few hit their targets of crying girls. Then I launched my offensive against their Operation Citadel, as Stalingrad had to survive from tact. I shouted charge and we intensified our attack on the central part of the snow wall, kicking it into smaller parts. Ammunition they had run out of ammo and we the Reds outnumbered them. It was a crushing defeat for them. And we concentrated our attack on the ringleader the battle organizer bashing him with the snow. It was so cold in 1969 that the lab started to cry just as Mr. Bennett came off to blow the whistle, we had won. Victory. Mind you the summer of 69 was different I lost and won a lot of fights in the playground. I was whacked on the arse by Mr. Bennett a number of times with a size 9 pump they called the Batman you had to go and get the Batman from the storeroom a punishment usually doled out for back sassing. High Chaparral was running up the telly. One hot night I got married in a pretend ceremony on Bellevue Street, outside, to a girl named Janet. My new wife was not around for long. The girl that sat on our doorstep was Leslie. Sometimes we sat on the top of our coal bunker, together looking at the stars. Chapter 2 Glam Emerging from the 60s marked by the end of steam power, holidays in Spain with my relatives were executed with a yearly frequency. These summer superheated breaks were for three weeks at a time. I was greatly influenced by the festival times like the Sardanas, these were circles of dancers accompanied by brass bands along the seafront in Bandalana and the huge firework displays. We stayed with my mom's brother and his sister Antonio who if you remember sent me the Ma Morgan Soledad and Catalina with her husband also called Antonio who was a bin man who gave me rides on his motorbike. I would play the Ma Morgan in the same contemplative manner on the balcony of the flat where we stayed, burned red in the hot sun. My father worked as a foreman at the Royal Ordnance Factory in Blackburn. My grandmother died in the late 1960s. In the 1970s I started going to play chemo school in Blackburn part of Billinge Grammar School. The house in Brumley Street was sold and we moved in with Granddad in Clay Lee Moores, whilst our house was being built in Rhodes Avenue, Plugate in Blackburn. I would travel to school in Blackburn every morning under the bus Big Red Harry. My granddad used to call it. I arrived at school even before the teachers very early. In winter I would stand near the coal-fired boiler house, the warm air permeated out of the flue vents. I remember that I would peer with amazement at the mechanisms through the slits in the vents. However, on one of those mornings I was chased by who lived in from Whitten Park School. No doubt they wanted to kick my old head in but I was too quick for them and they never got me. My granddad said I was soft that I should stand my ground and give them an uppercut. So we moved into Rhodes Avenue. At the back of the house was a long garden and a sloping field where you could see Floodgate School. Horses would come up to the barbed wire fence at the end of the garden so you could stroke them. The lamp wing skull here dwells in the past and haunts me now. School music in the classroom involved appreciation of records with discussions and singing in groups with a lady teacher playing guitar, no doubt the usual format for those times. According to my friends and my enemies too I apparently stood out with my singing. So I found out that there was something there and this is how I discovered my singing abilities. The 1970s music scene was of course glam and glitter. On a day trip to Blackpool a Saturday I think, in our car a rusty singer gazelle and all you could hear out of the shops and arcades was I'm the leader of the gang and further down the promenade at the central pier was another one more time sounding. Back in school the first two years there was mixed swimming and I was surprised to find one lad had only one ball as he showed me and everyone. You could still get a free trunk and towel when you forgot your own, the throwback to earlier years when we all lined up, saying trunk and towel at reception. You had to tie up the white triangular-shaped trunks at the side with a string. This one day I was the only kid to ask for a trunk and towel, probably when they were being phased out. During a length the trunks came loose and my arse was then on show to all the girls in the spectators' gallery. This was the start of my education and a girl played with my cock and balls under the desk in school, 
saying first can I have a bit of your dick? The expressions on my face towards the teacher in English, a lady with blonde hair, must have been mixed with anxious pleasure and shock at the same time. She used to do the rounds with another girl to all the lads and so compare notes. Of course it only happened to me once and this with her on coach trip will stay with me always. The 1970s were supposed to be a primitive society but sexual repression from earlier times certainly prevailed in my home life and sex was a dirty word and never to be uttered. From then on any sort of relationship was with my right hand for many years to come. I was supposed to meet my dad outside at night, that way came over after the coach got back to Blackburn from Preston. We had been to see a play at the Octagon Theatre. After the experience with the girl I started to panic. In all the confusion I could not find my dad so after a further panic attack the nocturnal meeting did not take place and I walked home without my dad who arrived home later. I went to bed that night with a longing in my heart, leaving all behind lost forever in 1972. Chapter 3 The Slow Stream After two years at Blade Kimoter I started at the main Binge Grammar School in September. Conquers fights, getting dirty in the woods, playing war games, with sticks as machine guns and pretending to be the six million dollar man in slow motion. I failed to achieve so I was placed with the other dunces at the bottom of the school, this being the slow learning stream, allowed only to do CSE examinations. Music in these circumstances was only meant to be therapeutic and no doubt used to pacify the poor dumb kids. Art was a subject that I was very interested in and I thought I could sit on my arts all day long doing paintings and earn a shed load of money. The art teacher tended to fuel this aspiration and she was full of compliments and praise and telling me just what I wanted to hear. However, it was the usual thing, no one cared for the subject and it was more like target practice for some band being the target for others. I also recall many poundings on the arts with a size 11 pump for talking, laughing and generally messing around. I shed myself at the thought of it. Once the whole school was us whacked boys and girls together. In business studies one girl threw a typewriter out of a second floor window and one lad bobbing in my typewriter well. Certainly there were no airline pilots in our year. However, I remember one year produced one lad with many a levels, he made it to being a working supervisor in a biscuit factory. No doubt the orange has had many successes but Tony Hancock coined the phrase in the threatening letter, when he also got fan mail from two hole in the middle jam fillers. Success seems to be dependent on the qualifications that you get but also on many factors. From my standpoint for many of us to at that time the practice of pigeonholing determines our future and probably starts very early in our lives. Academically I had not shown any promise so now my very existence was to be knocked out for me. The whole system seemed to be against me. In my trial examinations I achieved an average mark apart from science where I achieved the highest marks out of the whole school and the other pupils did very badly. However, those that were in the higher streams were allowed to take O-level mathematics and I was not allowed even to take CSE maths. I will never forget what one teacher said in front of everyone in the class. The results were announced for science even Kennedy has got 87%. I was not allowed any science, this was an injustice in the education system and I wanted to take the system on and from that point onwards I tried to be a rebel. As time passed I began to fight back on my own. I went to see the headmaster, I asked him if I could take CSE maths. He explained that I was allowed to do the maths exam and I was given a large green theory book. However, I was never allowed to sit in any of the classes. Without any teaching, I did achieve just above average marks. My dad who had an HNC in engineering taught me much about maths but that was not modern mathematics and this was a significant part of the exam. The rest was trigonometry, geometry and algebra so I think I passed this part of the paper and some of the rest. Musically I was pronounced inert, talentless and tone deaf by audition. One day a group of us talentless kids went to audition to learn an instrument, I picked clarinet. If we showed any inclination towards a certain level of music at the audition our poor parents would not have had to pay anything towards tuition or the instrument cost. 
I was asked to sing scales and to do intonation. Picking out notes and singing the pitch from an upright piano played by a man with long wild hair. I did my best but this albino said no. You are not good enough to learn an instrument and also your voice is not good enough either and we wouldn't be able to do anything with it. So I did no music and I said simply thanks and walked out in shock. I was though very surprised that this has only a short time ago many including teachers offered nothing but encouragement. One day before the Christmas period I attended the school service at the parish of St. Silas near to Bunge renamed Bunge High School at that time. The school choir performed and I was coming to the end of my school times. Oh! How I longed to be part of that social a eh, talent. After the service I sighed and walked away thinking I would not make it even to the back row. The slow stream took many casualties on its meanderings through the proverbial hills of education. Career death by drowning in its depths of ignorance and stupidity on many levels and its waters are rancid, stagnant and there is a steaming putrid sting of shit. One day an unexpected portal opened to me. On my way to school, I was rushing about. That morning was a particularly busy one. It was a dull gray day and I ran for the bus. On my way across the road I was hit by the sharp front of a yellow box hall diva. It sent me flying down the road on my briefcase that I was clutching in my right hand. It seemed just like the telly and strangely slow motion like. Surprisingly, I got myself up and in shock not knowing what had happened to me, I then walked to the bus stop. Then I realized that I had been hit and I then fell to the floor screaming in agony. All pedestrian eyes were on me now and a small circle of folks gathered around. Someone went for my mum, who came to the incident also screaming in Spanish and shouting Miko Miko Miko. The ambulance came for me and took me to the Royal Blackburn Infirmary. No bones were broken and they could not find anything wrong with my old head. I was badly bruised and I could not walk properly for weeks. In that slow motion event I think I was given another chance to pass to the next level. That thought gave me a new lease of energy and a new lust for life. Chapter for Apollo The word work is an abomination. How was I to escape? Indeed there was no escape, not for me anyway but what pathway was I to follow in my endeavors to procure work? I was a school reaver at 16 in 1976 with very little qualifications. Well, to everyone's surprise I made it into engineering as an apprentice, starting at the training center in Blackburn on George Street West. My first year was doing broad-based training, milling, turning, welding, fitting, sheet metal and grinding. Also block release at the technical college doing my city and guilds. After one year you had a certificate signed by Hugh Scanlon. I still have the certificate to this day. Then I began serving my time as a machinist at Apollo Precision Engineering in Darwin. I moved with my parents to a detached bungalow in the village of Hotelassen near to Darwin. Traveling to work on the bus for six days a week was an epic task for me, even after my mom's bacon buddies and no doubt this made me very grumpy and difficult to live with as a teenager. I hated every second passionately. From my perspective it was like being sentenced to four years of hard labor. On a typical winter's day I remember quite vividly, walking from the bus station. It was a frosty morning. Apollo was on the top of a steep hill called Robert Street. Snow in the middle of the night had melted and refrozen. Climbing to the summit was indeed on my part a heroic feat of mountain hearing I can't tell you and then to be greeted by Sam the huge bear like Alsatian at the green metal fences and gate. My duties included feeding Sam and the ferret. By the way the ferret scarred me to death the laborer Tommy used to hold him belly side up to make my eyes pop out of my head and strike terror into me with this. The Russians invaded Afghanistan with the advent of my first vocal tuition and exercises in confidence building began with me having to shout brew up at dinner and breaks in all the noise of the machines. In my endeavors of escapism I did the football pools with my dad. Both of us became interested in classical music and whilst earning money I was able to purchase a music center by going halves with him. The music center played cassette tapes, records and had a radio. The first record that was played over and over was Beethoven's fifth piano concerto The Emperor and then an uncontrolled obsession with the composer Beethoven. 
We also went to all the concerts at King George's Hall in Blackburn and discovered all the classics on offer. This included concerts by the Liverpool Philharmonic, the Hungarian State Orchestra and the Moscow State Orchestra. I became a person who was indeed very engrossed in classical orchestral music and especially later on with the music of Bartok, Stravinsky, Shostakovich, Schoenberg and Mahler to mention the few. The general feeling of isolation and deep inward reflection began to take over my life at a fast pace and to a point where it was devouring my very being. The actual interest and appreciation of this music, the actual inward reflection and escapism on offer was like a drug. It was like a black hole swallowing me up. And it did and it took my life. I would go to work, stand at my machine after a weekend concert and be in a sort of trance. Like a robot, I would churn out components. Everyone shouted at me as my production levels plummeted as I would be in my own world. One time whilst bolt cutting I remember one man throwing a coolant bucket at me for it to be filled. You had to get coolant outside from a big oil tank later to be filled with water shouting me, fucking coolant, you cunt. Sometimes I would be kicked up the arse and I became the butt of everyone's jokes. Imagine the worst kind of verbal abuse and this taking. It was a slow process but eventually they broke me and I ended up being a shell of a man with no confidence at all. I had no choice but to be bullied. Most were much stronger than me, proven by great feats of strength of lifting weights in macho competitions at breaks. I eventually learned my place. Even though this was my personal help, I was still able to appreciate the many skills that these young men had. They were able to produce beautiful pieces of quality engineering. These men were true artists in their own right and that most definitely was and is a true sentiment. I think I gained much respect though not from everyone by taking it on the chin and being passive in my approach to life. Also during break and dinner time it was a tradition to sit around the makeshift dinner table reading hard porn magazines. Someone was able to procure some amazing porn and I tell you that was a huge influence on my being. One instructor said before serving my time at the training center that I was in for a rude awakening, I certainly found out he was not joking. After chasing my boss down the road for my holiday pay, holidays came and went. Christmas was upon us and it was time for partying. The party was an event usually held at a nightclub in Manchester with meal included. I was allowed to dance with wives and girlfriends much to their amusement. It was in one of these nightclubs where I was first inspired by a singer singing the American National Anthem. It was a rock singer and that is all he did. I thought at the time, what a way to make money as a singer. Do one and go. However, it was many years before I found that I had any ability to sing in any way whatsoever. My only wish at the time was to be able to sing like this. Back on the coach to Blackburn by surprise myself by joining in the singing dirty songs on the way whilst one lad lifted up a girl's skirt showing me bit of thigh saying look at that myth. Just imagine giving it one. During all this I was learning to drive and keeping away from the parked vehicles. On the day of my first driving test one dreary, dull afternoon. I had a driving lesson first and then the test. From my point of view I got round fairly well but turning right into the test center off Preston New Road I looked in my rear view mirror indicated right slowing down through the gears, then stopping at the right turn, put the car into neutral, hand brake on and waited for oncoming traffic. When it was clear I looked in the mirror, released the hand brake and went rolling back down the hill. It was only a slight incline but that ensured my failure for that day and probably all my failings in my life. I finally realized that I was on the road to my demise. Finding that I was unable to procure a vehicle for my escape, the only way of escape was through listening to music. Music was my only diversion and outlet into another world. The world of socializing to me was not an option, as I am by nature a recluse and indeed terrified of every social outcome. My apprenticeship came to an end with a dodgy certificate signed by Hugh Scanlon and kind of verification pink slip from the EITB Engineering Industrial Training Board. At the end of my training after a pub crawl, I was thrown into the lily pond at Witten Park. Chapter 5 The Ministry Summer came again and I was made redundant from Apollo Engineering, as they would have had to pay me more as a skilled man. Indeed I had a good summer's rest and we went to Spain for the holidays. On our return home I applied to become a mechanical examiner at Royal Ordnance Blackbird with my dodgy engineering qualifications, city and guilds included. This was around September time. Blackberries. 
My father leaned on someone in the Ministry of Defense in true George Smiley style and I was recruited in 1980 with the signing of the Official Secrets Act. The autumn was a dark atmospheric time. Early in the morning my father dragged me from my bed, ready to be inducted into the ministry. After this you had a couple of months training in calibration then sent out to do loads of damage as my boss Fred Jones cited. I was sent to the wood hut. The wood hut was attached to a machine shop in the east block building outside and indeed as was implied made from wood. West block had a similar setup but was more experimental, development and orientation. A huge administration block and medical center was to the north and a massive canteen sports fields and calibration to the south. Inspection was my bag. Here. By autumn it was dark in the morning and wine swirled the brown leaves from swept up piles on my lonely walk to clock in at a building called Switch 10. This was another inspection block attached to the tool room in between east and west. Some happy times were had there but as always you end up with someone on your back for one thing or another. With me it was a few months before the long knives came out of the bottom drawer. People always ask you do you think you think you'll like it here? Every ten minutes. Then it was in the office, that was divided by a glass partition for assistant foreman at Ken Fat middle-aged man and with huge pot belly always sat down with feet on desk listening to the nags on the radio and another younger thin tall chap, Stuart who hated me with a passion because possibly I had more dodgy qualifications than him and both AFs considered me a threat, as my pops was fairly high up in rank. In here was a further solid door and partition for the foreman, Eric. Foreman wore suits, AFs white coats and mechanical examiners need dark blue coats. One typical day in the wood hut, we would all be sat down at our benches having a brew and a laugh. Bert behind me bald-headed, close to retirement, he always said every half hour he would soon be in the box. And at the end of the day, well ladies and gentlemen, shove it up your big fat ass. Jimmy another baldy character always laughing loudly in true operatic fashion all day long. Then there was another older baldy UFO believer George known as Stick Man as he walked with a stick and the younger guy in front, Colin a quite big muscular fit man, cynical and disillusioned in demeanor. Bert obsessed with his hair kept saying Colin's got a good head of hair and it was shoulder length and Colin indeed was like a young lion. Then Colin gets up out of his chair and looks over the partition saying look at that Monday there, head down or sup. And Ken would be their feet up listening to the radio. Then he says to Stickman who would be reading some paper article about UFOs fucking flying bell end. And Jimmy would let out a piercing belly laugh. Then the rate fixer makes his entrance, a white coat wearer with AF status. They came in every hour to check we were all working. The atmosphere would suddenly change Bert would have his magnifying glass in his eye holding up his component and I would start writing nonsense in an old report sheet. He comes to me and looks at me for a while. It felt at the time that I was the only one being closely scrutinized. He would go, and then Jimmy lets out another belly laugh. I would continue working as Bert sometimes would divert the rate fixer's attention by talking to him. They would start having long conversations that always ended in bullshit baffles brains Colin would then walk out of the wood hut in a John Wayne style after putting his name on the chalkboard. George remains inanimate as always with a goat on have a goat, I'm on my way out face. Retirement then the siren sounded and it was dinner time. I chased Jimmy down the road to the canteen. He was on his woodley old town bike laughing as I run after him. In the canteen he would get pies and go back to the wood hut. I would stay in the huge canteen queuing with all the prawns he meant proletariat p-r-o-l-l's. As Jimmy called it. Young girls would now be my tormentors here and would ask me out sometimes, and sometimes say my friend fancies you. I knew they were not sincere and had many boyfriends and taking the Jake as Bert would always say. There was never a girl for me I thought. On my way back from the canteen I would always take the scenic route back to the wood hut. That was the road behind West Block Experimental. The Transpennine Express ran past our OF and you could see it from my walk. Also trains to Preston, called me, no doubt the end of the line I thought to myself Scarborough. Clouds of flying white seeds would follow the trains, the girl called Michelle, remembered with affection, at St. Barnabas my old primary school called them fairies. She kept some in a tobacco tin. 
It was with the trains I would be at my most contemplative moods. Apparently a young man committed suicide on this stretch of railway after the loss of his love. Yes it was here I started to see my regressional spirits start to haunt me. Holidays to Blackpool on the train with my mum and dad. My dad, tickling me and I was laughing. My dad stroked the back of my neck as we walked along the promenade. Then with the passing of a freight train I fell and saw the screeching guys, coolant and smoke that Apollo Engineering cutting screws all day long and with the trains passing I saw my last day at Apollo. I was outside the factory on my own at the end of summer and a magical breeze suddenly came along and blew the large metal green gate shut. Sam the guard dog came to see me off through the metal bars. I said goodbye I miss that old dog. Back at the wood hut it was brew time. Ken the AF was lurking, no doubt watching to add black marks of lateness to my records. They were all saying in turn mix. Put somewhat the hint careful lad in a very strong Lancashire accent. Bert says this with his head swaggering from side to side and smiling with a sarcastic grin. So I joined in knowing that in an interview for a foreman's job, Ken said water instead of water, and this information was leaked. Shall I put somewhat the hint careful Bert? I said with a smile up one side of my face. I Bert growls. None of us would let it like. So Ken goes into the office with a red face staring at his feet. Jimmy lets out a cutting belly laugh. The kettle kettle was the central attraction on the brew table in front of the benches, a battered old thing that whistled and spluttered Ken's demons when ready to brew. Clouds of kettle steam could be seen from the office all day long and Ken would bob up and down briefly looking through the office window when it was brew time. I spent all afternoon sawing the now 32 fuse in half by hand so I could check inside for errors and write them down in a report sheet, in red pen and later handing it in to the office for the AFs to deal with. Rain came pelting down on the roof of the wood hut and running down the outside windows in blurring rivers. Through the front windows of the hut you could see east block assembly and workers, men in gray coats setting machines and women in light green coats operating the machines, capstan blades. Milling machines, drilling machines, wire eroding machines. Through the rear windows you could see the apprentice training room and through the side windows the high red brick wall. The siren sound it is time to go clock off and meet my dad to go home. My dad let me drive home in our Mazda 626 to practice for my driving test. My mom made steak pudding for tea to furnish our fat bellies. It was Friday no work tomorrow and a wonderful light in for the morning. Beer and whiskey chasers with my dad and cool hand Luke and Deliverance recorded on our new VHS video recorder to embellish our imaginations. Then after talking of the stars, God and the old story of my dad in the Merchant Navy after hot work in the engine room in the Far East, he had prickly heat and they had to have cold showers and homosexual man would try to shove bars of soap pop his arse. That story and many others would create fits of laughter and definitely stories to wall away into many a darkening evening. Saturday night was hot a lesson club night and moreover, snooker night, pints of Thwaites bitter, Newcastle brown ale and barley wine that put the road right through you. My dad was the snooker man and those in the club affectionately called him Jack instead of John. My dad had as a young man, thrashed Harold Todd with a 97 break it was in the evening telegraph. My dad was champion of Hot Alaskan Club. The prize was to watercolor paintings of the bridge and Darlant Hour by the secretary of the club James Yates Heap, a professional artist that also made frames for other artists, etc. Jim lived on Hot Alaskan Road and looked after a handicapped man. For someone. My dad said it might be an axe murderer he once told me. Art was a subject that was still an interest with me and after talks with Jim and viewing much of his portfolio on the walls of the club, I knew that I wanted to be an artist. A new way of escape I thought. Many days after that, I practiced my painting and drawing. My dad likened me to the film with Tony Hancock about an artist. The rebel so there was indeed a girl in my life, I met her in my Apollo days. I was 18 years old and Julina Schoolick, just 13. She lived not far away with mum and dad our OF people. Her mum cut off her beautiful long flowing blonde hair no doubt to scoot me, in a hands-off you creep gesture. However, I think I managed to gain some of their affections as her dad once let me in and let me listen to his magnificent stereo, 
to a version of the 1812 Overture Canons and all. Knowing that she was in my life probably was a matter of conjecture as far as she was concerned. Nevertheless I got her chalks and cards for Christmas signed simply with love xxxxx. I still have one of her cards reciprocated with the same, to this day. Now she was 16 years old with a real boyfriend instead of a man idiot like me, who was struggling to pass the driving test. Of course the boyfriend did not require a license and he did not have a car. However he did have a reliant Robin with L plates. I watched him pick her up through our front window behind the curtains while I was listening to Shostakovich. Now it was Monday morning again, time to go back to work. My mind was fired up with art as my dad drove us both to the fuse as it was known by local people thereabouts. I clocked in at switch 10. Morning Bert, I said, as my shoes clumped onto the hollow sounding floor of the wood hut. He replies in a singing voice morning as he opens the window to get a pint bottle of sterilized milk from outside on the window ledge. The milk was cool from the fresh damp weekend air. He opens it with a bottle opener. I go out and fill the kill with water water from the transit sinks. The road sweeper vehicle comes past and along the transit way joining all departments. I remember a woman always sitting on a chair with a brew on the transit, opening her legs to show all the lads. I always said good morning and cocked my cap. But she never said anything. The kettle goes on. Delectable women, women in light green would make their entrance into the wood hut all day long. A young girl would make her presence felt quite often, for me to solve a non-solvable problem with a Tessa measuring machine. I kept ordering parts from the tool room through Ken the AF but Ken would not put the order through, he just kept looking at the kettle and listening to the nags on the radio. I had to make the parts myself much to the amusement of many of the well-seasoned skilled men. The young girl was with red face and angry at me. I forget her name but she looked wonderful with defiance in her eyes. Sometimes the women would come to Bert, sometimes at the same time as the red face. Bert would imitate a female voice in a high-pitched nasal vocal production that was very funny to all of us. How are you going on Betty? Or whoever he would say. She would imitate him and answer okay. And they would have conversations in this kind of falsetto voice. The girls seemed never to catch on, though I am not sure. I think they might have enjoyed this banter. After dinner was not very soothing for the digestion and this one particular day, before the bad day at the office Colin kept looking over the partition and Ken looked at this Monday he would say and start playing air guitar and singing the theme from Deliverance D.I. The I die 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 and Bert would be pacing up and down like the floor walker in cool hand Luke if you play grab bars, spend the night in the box. To add to the ambience Colin smashes a large glass projector lens that had been left against the wall for the AFs to deal with, kicking it into smithereens with a boot. With defiant gestures he rants AA, CL and fucking safety. The song in half L32 appears as if by magic after dinner on my desk. There was something wrong with my inspection report. I was in for a bollocking 